so welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm just going to do a share screen here, and that'll allow you to see a, a chart. And then you can tell me whether um, you still see me as I'm speaking or if something goes really bad. Just uh, let me open this up. Yeah, Mark, you're in business. OK. OK, so there we are, the True North Caricature Carvers, uh, our January 20th meeting. And um, we have John Paul Andre here from uh, Nova Scotia. And I'm Mark Sheridan, of course, from Kingston. So welcome to all of those folks that uh, are returning. And we have a few new members here tonight as well that I hope will continue to come back and join us for this. Um, the, uh, the discussion we're going to have tonight is uh, we'll start off by just opening up for questions and comments again. And the idea behind that is uh, anything that you have seen uh, in our last number of Zoom calls or sessions or any comments you might have come up with since then, uh, now would be the time just to raise those. Um, the, the second item on our agenda, Daniel Sloan uh, received a caricature carving book uh, for Christmas, I think. And he's going to do a little book review for us. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And uh, the, the hope in that is that not only, you know, it might be something that will interest us to go out to get the book ourselves, but um, I suspect Daniel's probably already seen some things in that book that uh, would be good subject matter for ourselves to pick up on on uh, subsequent Zoom calls, where we might want to expand our thinking on that a little bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the projects that are underway, your individual product projects that you've sent in, some of which uh, um, you might uh, enter into our uh, True North Character Carving competition and show. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and get you to um, pr present what you've, uh, what you've accomplished. Um, had a good chat with uh, Furtis, I, I guess a few weeks ago now, Furtis, and we talked about um, good practices around dust control. And so uh, I put just one slide together on that. And uh, and Ferdish, you can probably just kind of help me introduce that thought and just get everybody's, um, everybody's thought and input on what you do in your shop or in your, uh, in your corner of your basement, if you're like me, uh, that, that helps you manage dust. And then John and I talked a little bit uh, earlier about adding a new item into our agenda, and we called it tips, chips, and tricks, only because that's difficult to say 10 times. Uh, but the idea, the idea behind that is every time uh, we come to one of these sessions, we'll just take uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about any quick little tips that we have for one another. And so John and I will get the ball rolling tonight. We have two or three items we'll, we'll uh, bring to your attention that we think that might be useful. And uh, the thought behind that is that if you have something that uh, you'd like to share in uh, the next Zoom calls, then maybe just give me a heads up and I'll make sure that uh, there's a photograph on it or anything that you need to help you talk about that particular tip. And so there'll just be a little informal way for us to do that, okay? Okay, any questions on the agenda? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Uh, so uh, again, welcome to everybody. We've um, we've got some new members. Um, uh, you know, I can't see everybody's faces right now, uh, but we have. Uh, I know Sue McCollum is uh, joining us for the first time this time. Sue, I was a little bit worried about you joining, only because I know that on Instagram, don't you call yourself True North Carver? I do. <laughs> okay, so so you're not here with a lawyer around patent infringement or anything. No, no, no. <laughs> no? I, I think I've had that one since about 2017. <laughs> okay, so it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> but yeah. welcome to the group. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm I'm going to miss some of the people here, but I know I talked to um, to uh, Richard Holden. I don't know if Richard's on the line tonight. Yep, I'm here. Oh, great. So, so Rich, Richard's actually um, a very experienced carver as well as just as Sue is, and he's from West Virginia. And um, if, if you want to look up some of Richard's stuff, um, his, uh, his blog and his Facebook site is Cartoons to Carvings. And he's put together some pretty interesting things. Um, I'll, I'll mention again, Sue's thing is True North Carver, so you can find her on Instagram and, and Facebook as well. And Sue does a kind of smaller caricature figures, really interesting little figures. So, you know, there's two new individuals that um, 
that I've spoken to res recently that's joining the that is joining our little group here. And the, the hope is that we're able to, you know, take people like Sue, take people like Richard and others that uh, that have their own experiences in character carvings and, and have them lead discussions and uh, and give us some insight into how they do carving. So so looking forward to that. And, and so just just given that um, another good discussion I had this uh, this past month was with Alec Pritchard. And we talked about a variety of things, but one of the interesting things that came up in our conversation is that, you know, really what we're all about here in this group is a very informal discussion about carving and specifically caricature carving. And, you know, John and I uh, have purposely tried to remind ourselves and remind everybody that we're not here to tell you how to carve or dictate this is the way you should carve because Mark Sheridan carves that way or this is the way you should carve because John Paul Andre carves that way. We're just saying this is the way we carve. This is what we this is what we do. And if you can kind of pick some items out of that that are useful to you, then that's great. If 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 not and you uh, and you have your own way to do things, then we want to hear about that as well because we all learn regardless of whether we've been carving for a long time or just a little bit of time, we all learn from one another. So um, so, so it, it's not that, uh, you know, if, if you're leading a discussion or have a point of view, you're not stepping on John's toes, you're not stepping on my toes. Uh, we, we really want to have everybody opening up and, uh, and sharing what they know, okay? So, so given that little, uh, little bit of a welcome and opening, are there any comments or questions from anybody that, that you want to deal with before we get going here? Okay, one of the things, I don't think Lee Baldwin is on the call tonight, but one of the things uh, Lee sent me the last week was uh, he had received a book on caricature carving for Christmas by Dave Stetson. And Dave Stetson is a pretty well-known caricature carver. Uh, I forget where he's from. He's down in the States. I can't remember which state, but you'll see him on YouTube and that type of thing. But, uh, but Lee sent me something that I thought was interesting. And this isn't verbatim from Dave Stetson's book, but this is the gist of it. Dave is defining caricature carving. So he says, caricature by definition is exaggeration of realism, um, and, you know, as opposed to being like, listen, I gotta, I gotta move this thing so I can read it for myself here. So caricature by definition is exaggeration of realism, whereas a cartoon can be regarded as a distortion of realism. I thought that was pretty interesting way to think of it. Caricature by definition is exaggeration of realism. So we talked about like bigger ears, bigger nose, bigger eyes, bigger mouth, that type of thing, bigger hands, bigger feet. Whereas a cartoon should be regarded as a distortion of realism. So it's not really going to look real. It's a distortion. You went on to say in a caricature, joints bend where they're supposed to bend and the basic proportions of anatomy are respected, but exaggerated for effect without distortion. So again, it's kind of like what we've been talking about, right? is, uh, you know, the, you know, we, we talked several times, go to Pinterest and look at the stuff they have on, on sketching anatomy, because it's the same proportions we want, basically, in our caricature carvings, but we want that exaggerated, but you don't want to distort it, because if it's distorted, all of a sudden, if you're doing a man, it doesn't look like a man anymore, right? And the last point here is basic realism is respected, as are things like the folds and draperies of clothing. So I thought that was a good definition uh, that Lee sent us from uh, Dave Stetson's book. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd bring it here because one of the things that uh, rings true about this is uh, last time we were together, perhaps the time before, we talked about, well, can you have a mythical caricature? Can you have an animal caricature? And, and I think by this definition that, yeah, you can do all of those things. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're doing a little, a little elf or a gnome or an animal of some sort, if you're exaggerating things, exaggerating the realism of it, it becomes a caricature. Okay, so I just thought I'd bring that and share that with you. Hey, Mark, could I share something that goes with what you just said? You bet. Because I cartoon as well. And in um, cartooning, when you draw hands, you only have the thumb and three fingers. Hmm. So that's a good example. When you look at any, most cartoons, you'll see their hands have a thumb and three fingers. That works great for cartooning, but in 
caricature carving, if you did a guy with a hand with a thumb and three fingers, that would stand out pretty drastically. That's a really good point, Richard. Yeah. Thanks for that. Okay, any other comments? Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is Daniel, it's over to you and you can talk a little bit about uh, your book review. Now, I have two photos, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek, Daniel, so you know what they are. I have that one and I have this one. Okay, perfect. So you tell me where you wanna go. Okay, I'll, I'll just call for them. Good. Uh, first off, my name is Daniel Sloan. I live in Grand Bend, Ontario. Um, I've been carving and messing around with drawing for a very long time. Uh, I'm not the greatest at, at it, but I do enjoy it. Uh, this is my very first time presenting, so be gentle with me. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them. Uh, the book that I'm going to review was my daughter was uh, kind enough to give to me for Christmas, and it's called The Mad Art of Caricature. So it's not necessarily about carving as much as it's the art of caricature. And it was uh, produced by Tom Richmond. We got to thank Tom for that because it's a tremendous book. And it's he worked with the Mad Magazine people. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you look through the magazine or this, this book, you, you can tell it's tremendous. And it was made in uh, 2011. Um, so it's uh, like, once again, it's called The Mad Art of Caricature, um, A Serious Guide to Drawing Funny Faces. And um, the, there's num the number of pages, 170. These are just some statistics right off the top. Uh, once again, it was made in 2011. The cost of the book I got, or she got it from Amazon, was $31.96. The author is Tom Richmond and forward by Nick uh, Meglin. It is, in my mind, a tremendous book. I have, have, I'm still having a lot of fun with it. Uh, the drawings, this is a, uh, no, I, what are we doing for? How about if I put that photo on as well? Yeah. Yeah, that looks good. I can see the cover. Oh, you can see the cover? Okay, there's the cover there. Um, and it, the, as you can tell, it's very colorful, uh, well presented, and uh, it's got some great ideas. Now, I just kind of wandered through the, um, the uh, contents, and it, 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 I'll just read it, read it through, uh, not to get too boring, but uh, what is a character, basic character theory, head shapes and alpha shapes, Drawing and, and uh, caricature and features, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, uh, lower face, upper head, um, beyond the face, drawing live caricatures, for example, going to, uh, say, um, uh, an art uh, Saturday afternoon and drawing characters live. Uh, you've seen them, you've gone to, you know, uh, places and they, they've had people sitting around drawing caricatures for sale. Uh, characters and illustration and characters from Mad Magazine. Uh, there's some, <laughs> some really funny stuff in, in it. And you can change the next picture. Okay. These are just a couple of ideas coming from, uh, and you'll see, you'll notice there's a lot of people, you, there's Leslie Nielsen and what, what he did in drawing for him. And there's a, a, an upper idea uh, of the upper head and, and the eyes and how they're, how they're designed. Uh, tremendous ideas on the head, on the hands rather. How's that? Yep. There's the, some more pictures of the, the hands. He takes his time and the descriptive writing is really um, excellent, excellent level. Uh, you can, you read through it and it, it makes you think. And I took, uh, I took a, a, a book and sat down and started keep, you know, taking notes and 
Uh, that's what I do every time we have a, a Northern meeting is I, I, I sit down and make notes. And so it gives me a chance to go back to it later on and, and uh, develop, develop ideas on, on what's going on. Um, let me see what else we got going here. Uh, um, the eyes. Uh, it just basic the ba it goes over the basic anatomy of the eye, the pupil, the iris, um, all the different designs of it, and how to draw it, and his ideas on how he thinks it should be. Um, if you look from the side, you'll notice that the eye. The, the uh, eyeball cornea, they protrude slightly. Hmm. So if you're thinking about this, like I, I don't know anybody that cars that doesn't sit down and draw, make a drawing of what they want to carve and then go ahead and draw it, uh, carve it in 3D. So this gives an idea of drawing and it improves on your, your practice of drawing. Um, it's not the very first the first book I've I've actually uh, got on uh, on drawing. Uh, Dave Stetson's book is an is a tremendous um, the one that Mark was mentioning earlier. That's a really good book. Uh, he uh, he uh, spent a lot of time making that book, as did uh, Tom. Uh, it's got a brief history of Tom and what he what he's done, um, and the, the forward it explains you know where he was where he's from and um, how he got started in in, in drawing. Um, let me see. Uh, does anybody have any questions? That sounds really good, Daniel. If you think of any questions along anyways, I, it's just a short uh, presentation because like I said, I need a lot of practice at this. So. No, no, that, no, that's great. But you I, know, I was, to... as I was listening to you, like a lot of the things you said uh, were similar to what John was saying to us when we were practicing how to, how to carve an eye and that type of thing, right? In the, on the face. Exactly. And so, so yeah, exactly. it's a good resource from that standpoint. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's it especially it is especially for that. Like if season comes up um, Valentine's Day, you know, and you want to do something, or uh, Christmas, you know, you, you sit down and you start sketching it out. John's yeah. really good at doing that. Yeah. Well, this book this book helps you to move to more of the character side, and 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 uh, it, it's just tremendous. Like like I said. Uh, you know, the bigger ears, the larger mouth. You know, if somebody's got a long nose, you can make the make the nose longer. Yeah. And I think that's about it for now. Uh, if there's okay. anybody has any questions later on tonight, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thanks, Daniel. That's really great. Okay, thanks. Okay, next thing on our agenda is just to take a look at, not just, take a look at our projects and talk a little bit more about the True North Caricature Carving Competition. So again, for, for everybody to remind everybody, but for those who, um, who are new to us uh, this evening and maybe didn't see our earlier communication, we're just trying to have a little bit of a show and friendly competition uh, in March. And so it, it's a matter of between now and our March um, Zoom session, uh, bringing our projects here so that we can take a look at it. Uh, you know, we can talk a little bit about the individual projects. I'm more interested in seeing what the carver themselves have to say about their own project. Um, but if you have a work in process project that, um, that you're preparing for the show, we can give you a few tips along the way so that it's better than it, than it is today when it gets to show time. Um, just to remind you some of the milestones, we said that uh, uh, everyone should have their carvings entered by February 27th. And uh, the judging will occur between that date and the next uh, uh, True North Character Carver meeting in March. And the judging will be done by, by John and I um, at the March 10th meeting. Okay, so, uh, so hopefully 
Well, I think we've probably got about eight or nine or 10 entries right now. Hopefully we get a number. We have uh, novice, intermediate and uh, advanced or open class. And so uh, hopefully we get a few in each and just have a little bit of fun with this. So let's go to the projects. Um, here's, here's a project that uh, Bob Thompson sent in. Bob, do you wanna say a little bit about that? I would just, uh, it didn't start out this way. It was a different character, but then when I, I got it cut out, it didn't seem to fit the, the cutout. So I changed it a little bit <laughs> and uh, made it into a mountain man. But anyway, it was a backpack on and a, a cane and then I put a rifle on. Now, are you entering this one in the show, Bob? Sorry, you're you're cutting in and out. Uh, try that again. Okay. Yes, I I I didn't think so at the time, but uh, maybe I will do. Okay. Good. See how it goes. Yeah. Good. I, I, you know, I, I think it's so good, Bill. I I notice you're not on Bill Hamilton. I notice you're not on mute, and so uh, we can hear we can hear your your microphone, and it's. Sorry, okay, I'll turn it no, on. that's okay, Bill. Just just put it on mute. It's a little easier. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I was going to ask you, uh, Bob, what did you make the cane out of? Is that carved or? Yes, it is carved. Yeah, I uh, I just had a, a a piece of wood that was about an inch and a half, and I just cut it out and I carved it. Or... Good. Good. So, so what I noticed of that is like the, the face, I think you really got the nice roundness in the face. Like John spent a lot of time talking to us about, you know, the roundness in the face. And I think you did a really nice job on that. And, uh, uh, you, you know, you might look at it and say for, for your next carving, how would I round out the rest of them to the same extent that you rounded out the face, right? Okay. I see your point. I, when I'm looking at it, yeah. Yeah, but but the face, you know, that to me, like you you nailed the roundness and the plumpness of, that you want in the face. The other thing I was going to ask you, did you do the heads the hat separately, or is that all one piece? No, the hat is all one piece. Yeah. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, that looks good. We talked about the the hats a, a few times ago, and it, you know, I, I my style would, and I think John's style too would have been to would be to try to do the hat separately. I just find that if I do the hat separately, the hat seems to sit better on the head. And one of the one of the problems I always had with um, doing the hat and the head at the same time, I'd end up making the hat too small. I don't know why, but I always ended up making the hat too small. So it looked like it just sat on top of the head. You, you've done a good job here if you did it all in one piece to make it look like the hat was around his head and on his head. So that looks good. Okay, and then Bob, you sent us in this one as well. Yes, uh, I seen a picture of this this guy sitting on this bench. It wasn't the same type of bench, but anyway, I tried to duplicate that. And then once I got the bench made, I uh, that I put the guy on it, and I did add the arm, and I did the hat the way you guys did the hat. Well, did you good? Yeah, and. Uh, then I thought, well, maybe he should have a dog. So then I carved the dog. The dog is out of uh, butternut, but the guy, the guy is out of uh, basswood. Oh, that's that's really super. Good. I really like that. I really like that. That's neat. When I got the bench made, I had to do cut his leg off because his leg was too long. So I had to attach his leg again. <laughs> Which is that? Is his leg was too long to reach the floor? Yeah, no, it, it was longer than the floor. Like, oh, I see, yeah, yeah. So I had to cut it off and shorten it up a bit. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. A, a couple of things when I saw this, I really like that bench. That's really a unique bench. Um, but you took on a couple of really difficult things. I, I, I don't know whether you realized it at the time, but, but I've... In, in my caricature carving, I've always found it difficult when I'm placing a caricature on something to do exactly what you just described, to get it right the first time in terms of lengths and whatnot. 
And so a little bit later in the meeting, I put a little tip to that I'll, I'll raise up with you. But, but one, of the, one of the things that I've uh, done, and we talked a little bit about it on these uh, Zoom calls, is a, is a clay model first. It takes a little longer to do the clay model. But if you, had, if you have, like in your case, the bench, then you know exactly how high that arm has to be. And, and you now can push that arm because it's just soft clay. You can push it anywhere you want it. You could have the you could have the arm right along the rail of the bench if you wanted, you know, because it's just clay. And same with the with the two legs, because they're clay, you can manipulate it all over the place. It, it, it's really difficult. Uh, like you took on a real challenge here, and, and uh, you know, I, I commend you for that because it's difficult to kind of get all of those parts right when you're sitting it on something. The other difficult thing to do is that I found for myself is proportions is like if i i've got it if my if i know the guy's arms are going to be down i know the proportions of the arms but as soon as you lift an arm up the proportions can change in your mind you know and so you know getting this length the same as that length getting this length the same as this length to the knee you know that's difficult to do when when you're when you're doing a caricature other than just kind of standing straight or sitting straight you you've got a guy with his arm up and his leg crossed that's difficult to do um so i, I think yeah, i think that's 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 a real good uh real good try at it that's really well done any other comments okay john you had uh you had sent in a couple here yeah <clears throat> i'm not sure which one i want to go with or yeah, it'd probably be one of these. Um, as Uncle Sam and their Sasquatch, both of them I started at a, a rendezvous, and then they just sat there. <laughs> I haven't touched them since. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, get me inspired to get back to uh, this kind of work and finish them up. Hmm. Um, Uncle Sam, I spent most of the time just on his hat, uh, and, and one one hand, and uh, the rest of it is still in the in the rough out stage. Uh, the Sasquatch, I spent a lot of time on the feet, uh, and you can see a close up. He's got a, a toe raised, and uh, started to do some of the hair, but uh, and the Sasquatch face doesn't have any uh, any eyes yet either. I don't know if you can see a close up here. Oh, yeah. So he needs to have some work done on his face. And of course, all the hair. Now, the hands is something else I wanted to uh, maybe get some pointers on. That hand doesn't look very realistic. And the other hand, I haven't even started yet other than to draw it in. So maybe some pointers on those hands as well. <laughs> Any comments for John? I don't think any of us know what a Sasquatch hand should look like, John. That's the issue. <laughs> I can make it look like anything. Man. <laughs> yeah. I think these are really cute carvings. The only, the only thing I would say about, about this is rather than Uncle Sam, why don't you make a, a Sasquatch and his handler? <laughs> yeah. Could be his, car, car, his carnival handler, you know? Put yeah. a... Uh, you know, I think that that'd make a funny little story, a little character. You know, you could, you could even think of a little sign that you'd have there or something. Uh, yeah, I could, make a little, a, I could put a leash on him and tie him a, to the a leash on him, him or something like that. It'd be, it'd make a cute little story. You know. Yeah. 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 Any story. other comments for John? Well, uh, I think the story would might be is uh, the handler pointing. And a, Scott, a Sasquatch points with his toe. <laughs> Pointing back at him. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he uses. He doesn't use his hands. He uses his toes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's I, good. That's I, good, John. They can make a good story out of that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks okay. for your comments. Thanks, John. Okay, Alec, uh, I think you're on the line tonight, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe he isn't. 
Well, Alex sent two in. So this one was, um, this was, was represents the problems you get into when you take your dog for a walk and he does his business and you only brought one bag, he told me. <laughs> so you see Alec did a pretty good job on this. Uh, you know, if Alec had been on the line, I would have asked him how he did the hat because that uh, the brim on the hat is really thin and it looks really good. I'm, I'm wondering if, he's, if he, uh, he added that separately. Any comments on this one, folks? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's pretty darn good. He's yeah. got the caricature, the way the dog is, is pro yeah. pro proportions. <laughs> yeah, just right. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> hey, John Paul, you you've mentioned to me a couple of times about uh, one of your yeah. things is making sure that the guy's eyes are going in the right direction. It really tells the story. What, what would what would your comment on this one be? Uh, it's, it looks good. I, I'm not too sure. It, it's a good, it's a good one. Uh, if you have always had, like if it's in the winter time, you always have that hand warmer too. You put those, uh, turds in a bag is good hand warmer. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, I, I was wondering, John, like, like you, you have told me a number of times that you try to place the eyes looking at a particular thing. So I wonder if, if Alec, uh, you know, would have improved on this by looking at the dog or looking up a little bit more in disgust or that kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that would have been a story too. Could have added to the story if his eyes were up and yeah, looking yeah. up yeah. upward is what am I going to do now? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the second one that Alec uh, sent in, um, he showed us last time as well, and this was done for a friend of his who's retired from the RCMP. And so it's really well done. And you can see he's, he even used a piece of leather belt there for, uh, to, to make a little leather belt. So, and it says, if you can't read it, honey, where's my pants? Another cop, cop, uh, cop with his pants down. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, okay, Richard, you're on the line and you sent this one in. Yes, uh, a number of questions on it. First of all, I, I think your definitions at the beginning sort of says that, yes, this could be a caricature. I, I think so. It's an exaggeration, right? Like uh, you can tell it's a bull, but you've exaggerated a lot of aspects of the bull. I, I would call it a caricature, sure. It's not a in the round caricature, which is maybe a little bit unusual, but, uh, but, but I, I, I would call it a caricature for our, for our little show here. Okay, so I guess the question coming out of that is, do the things we, we're submitting have to be in the round or can they be uh, more of a, of a relief? Yeah, it, you know, we just put out a few guidelines for this just so that we could have some fun with it and learn from it. And we didn't say in that that it had to be in the round. Um, you know, others on the line can help me. I can't think of any um, shows in Ontario that I would have attended where the caricature, where it said under caricatures, it had to be in the round. I think it just said caricatures. I think the guidelines were just caricatures. Thank you. That 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 opens up for me a whole bunch yeah. of, of different things. Yeah. Uh, the second part of, of the questions I, I sent you is, um, it is hard to see the back of his, uh, the hump of the back, it, it uh, dissolves. Yeah, right where the arrow is, it dissolves right into the background. So I have to finish it somehow. And it, building on some of the discussions that you had earlier on, how would people, what are the options that they would use? Do you paint it? And if you paint it, do you have to put something on first? Do you use an oil? Um, do you try a, a, a finish? Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 as I said, I'm, I, I'm in, a, in, a, in an apartment with limited uh, spaces and that, so I don't have a wide variety of things that I could put on. Sure somebody else can jump in on this one? 
Um, if I if I could just make a comment, I, I use acrylic paints. Uh, I, I love them. They work well. They're economical uh, and they're water soluble. Uh, so I, I think that what uh, not being a real pro at this, but you need to add a little darker color, perhaps in the background on the hump. Would it would make that step out a little bit more? What, what do you think, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Hey, if I uh, could I, I might... Go Richard? ahead. Go ahead, Richard. You go ahead, and then John will pick up. Well, what I was going to suggest is um, bowls are not normally white. So instead of focusing on the background, what you could do is um, either take your wood burner at a very low heat and give the bowl some color, or you could do a watered down um, acrylic like a burnt umber, and you could paint the bowl. And that would give, that would have the bowl stand out from the background, opposed to trying to make the background stand out from the bowl. You could even just go to the hardware store and get some Howard feed and wax and put the Howard feed and wax only on the bowl. And that would give it a golden tone, which would break up the background from the body of the bowl as well. Does that wax look good um, on basswood, Richard? Oh, I love it. It looks great on basswood. It gives okay. it a golden color. All my carvings are done with acrylic paint and um, Howard Feed and Wax, and I don't put any finish except for the Howard Feed and Wax on it, mm. and it really just gives it a beautiful color. Mm. Yeah, I'm Dan here, I, that's exactly what I do too, just okay. exactly that. Yeah. Okay, my gentlemen, gentlemen, if if I might jump in, uh, it's Howard Feeding Wax, and where where would you buy it? I, I got mine at um, our local uh, home hardware, and where that was in Grand Bend, so it's around, and it's Howard Feed and Wax. So, so just so that I understand, uh, you know, what Richard has here is unfinished basswood, and are, are you guys saying put the wax on the basswood or first paint it with acrylic and then finish it with the wax? Okay. You could do either way. Okay. Yeah. You could paint it and then put the Howard on, or you could just put the Howard feeding wax on. If you're going to do the Howard feeding wax, you could, or the paint, you could take your wood burner on a very low heat and just burn the edge of the bowl so that it doesn't bleed. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds like you got some good input there, Richard. Thank you very uh, my, much. My, I, I appreciate. Yep. Jump yeah. Jump. My my thoughts. Yeah, my thoughts. With you're muted, John. John, you're on mute. How about now? Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, my my idea would have been to uh, put a background, a blue blue sky and green grass or you know uh look, would burn some uh, grass you know about uh not not halfway about a uh, quarter way up put some grass and some blue sky and maybe clouds or something that would bring up that bowl out to and paint the bowl though i would like to see that bowl painted like richard said the browns and stuff that would really make it pop both I can't see me, so hopefully this is in the picture, mm -hmm. but this is what it is. Sorry, hold on here. Yeah, that's the stuff. Let me, uh, let me stop the screen share so we can uh, see you better. Okay, everybody see that okay? I just see you, Mark. Yeah. Everybody just sees yeah. me. I see Daniel now. Yeah, he's yep. got you, you got you'll have to speak up and then show, show the oh audience. okay. Here you go. So it's Howard Feed and Wax, and it's feed the letter N and the word wax. So Howard Feed and Wax. It's a golden elixir for wood carvers. 
<laughs> Again, thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Richard. Okay, Baz sent us in a couple of carvings, this in the next slide. So Baz, why don't you describe what you've got here? Okay, this is a, um, a first carving that I sent in. It's a little gnome. Um, I call him Airy Sam. I like to give names to my carving. That way, it gives me an idea on the finishing and so on. I still have to do a bit more carving for the back of his hair and so on. So that's the first one I did. So uh, I'm gonna try to paint it and finish it so I can put it in the show. So it was a lot of fun to do. So it's a no see -um. You don't see the eyes or anything, so no see -um. And so that's the story behind that one. It was done for, it's pretty small actually. It's only, um, you know, I have it right here, so it's not big at all. I'm gonna just bring it up. I don't know if you see it. Yep. So it's not big, it's about two and a half inch high. So that's what I'm gonna finish and try to put in the show. And then I sent the second one. I think you might have pictures of that. So that one is a bit more complex uh, for me. Uh, I started this um, uh, last summer, the summer before, and I was just at camping and I was just took a block of wood. I, had not, I didn't have a scroll saw or anything. So what I did is I actually uh, started carving it. And I had a book of Pete LeClaire beside me and I was trying to follow the way he does faces and so on. And I got to a certain point and I said, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm gonna stop because I'm, I'm stuck. So I, I stopped there. And when I saw that you wanted to do a, a little a show and it's just for the fun of it, things like that, I said, okay, I'll pull this back out. And I needed some inspiration on what to do. So all of a sudden I was on the web and looking at Pinterest and other things. And then I thought of something uh, when I look at the face and the hat that he had on, it looked like a mechanic. So I said, maybe I could call him uh, Grease Monkey Jack. That, that's the name I'm going to give it. It's Grease Monkey Jack. So then I start looking at different cartoons and things, and I'm gonna, that's going to inspire me to try to finish it. So that's the idea behind that one. But to finish the head and other parts and so on, I've been reviewing the videos on YouTube of our group, because I missed quite a few meetings last year and I'm trying to catch up and there's a lot of good ideas. I'm gonna focus on that to try to, to finish it and, and work at it. And I'm really gonna try to put it in to uh, the thing I would like to finish it off. I have some ideas. Um, I'm gonna attach two hands to them and they're gonna be something in the end. So I will, I'll leave it to that for now <laughs> and, and I'm gonna, look at you've been giving some uh, ideas how to attach things so i'm going to look it up and i'm going to do something about that so so that's what i have right now for those that's good baz comments for Thanks. baz from anybody it's looking from my perspective that's looking good Baz. the the only uh the only thing i'd say is that this here line that you've drawn the, the rounded line i always like better than a straight line right and so I know you're just in the process of doing this, but as you get down to the legs here, just, just be careful with, you know, the, you know, I know you just put these uh, to give your eyes something to look at, but watch out for straightness. Like I'd, I'd prefer to, to have you think of that more as rounded in the back here, more as rounded. You can think of, you know, even if you stood in front of um, um, a mirror, you know, the back of your pants wouldn't necessarily, unless they were very tight pants, the back of your pants wouldn't necessarily hug you like that. There'd be more of a rounded look to it, you know? So, yeah. so if you are looking at the past videos, you'll see some of the things that John talked about in, in caricature carving, where basically he said, everything should have a curve to it, you know, and, and, unless it's a piece of machinery uh, and everything on your body should be, shouldn't be straight. And, and it just, I, I don't know. I think it makes the caricature look a little nicer. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're doing that. Okay. Thank you. Mark, can I uh, give a suggestion to Baz? Uh, just as a comment that you'd made earlier about the hats and that kind of thing. Uh, 
when you're carving it, the, the picture on the left-hand side, Baz, it's sitting on top of him. The hat doesn't fit. But what I would do to change that is to uh, carve the hat off and make the top of the head round and then carve a cap that would be appropriate to the size of the head. And like Mark has shown us before, you cut the top of the head off at the angle you want the cap to be at. Like we see in the photograph the, or the graphic on the left-hand side, it sits on the back of his head and curls come down. So by taking the back of the head off, moving the proper size cap back, then he's got that attitude that comes with the mechanics cap being pushed up, the beak being pushed up. I don't know if that helps you or not, but it's a thought. Yes, it does indeed. Thank you. Right. Also, too, if you're on Facebook and if you're a member of the Helvy Club or group, yes. if you go to the files, there's a file where Ryan Olson does a demonstration of carving a little body character. And his setup is pretty similar to what you have. So you might want to look at that and see how he sets up the rest of the body. I think it would help you because I think you've got pretty much close to the layout that he uses. So the name of the carver is? Ryan Olson. He's one of the okay. CCA members. Okay, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, guys. All right, Fertis sent in uh, this, this uh, work in process project. Yeah, so I used the, the pattern out of uh, Dave Stetson's book that was talked about uh, earlier in the meeting. Um, I, I enlarged the, his pattern by one, uh, like 33%. So the block of wood that I used to, to cut on the band, so it's like four, four and a half inches wide by, it's three inches deep and eight inches high. I'm still working on the body. I did make some progress on the body after I sent you that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the head is already carved. The, uh, so uh, next I'm gonna work on the hands. Uh, one of the hand is holding a, a stick and the other hand is uh, just open wide as you see in the pattern. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's what I'm working on. I, I might put him on a base. I'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so had a lot of fun with him. Uh, it's the first time I cut this pattern on on a bandsaw. Uh, I had some challenges, but I uh, was able to make through it. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I'll make it good enough so I can submit in the competition. Yeah, it looks like it's gonna be good enough for sure. Any comments for Fertis? I noticed the the head furnace. Um, what you know, I've I've I guess I kind of model my heads after what I've seen Lynn Doughty do, in terms of being able to insert the head into the body. And and as we mentioned before, once that's drilled out, you you have a little bit of advantage that you can move the head around a little bit and position it the way you want it. Um, the neck, my neck is usually quite a bit longer for that reason. I usually have it down like this, tapered. And then that allows me to sit it into this hole that you're going to bore and, and gives you a little room for forgiveness if you want, that you don't see the bottom of it. Um, now, you said this, I think you said this was a Dave Stetson pattern. Yeah. Is this the way Dave does it, is that he truncates it off the bottom like that? So his, his uh, was a little bit longer. Um, but what I did was... I kind of uh, made a little bit more progress on the body. Mm -hmm. So I did uh, gouge, like I didn't use a drill or anything. I just kind of gouged yeah. it out. So I had to make it a little bit more shorter than what you see. And uh, I might put a dowel in there and just kind of oh, okay. put the head on like okay. this. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's looking good. I just noticed right away, like I, if I would have done that only because I, I kind of got myself used to doing it the way Lynn Doughty does it as I, right. as I make quite a taper in the end. And it just gives me a little more freedom to have them look up or down and you don't see that cut piece at the bottom, you know, just, just something that I, I've become Make more sense. To. Yeah. It's, it's the first time I'm trying this head separate. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I could have 
I could have cut it a little bit shorter. Now, I, I also got to say, I really like his hairline. I know, there's just something about caricatures with this haircut I like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got the hairline pretty back on the head. Like, yeah, he's yeah. a half bald guy. That's the kind of guy I like. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Any more comments for Furtis? Yeah. I yeah, I was going to suggest. Go ahead, I sir. hope I'm not talking too much. But no. I was going to suggest instead of a wood dowel, use a piece of copper wire. Okay. Now you're going to want a pretty thick piece, depending on the size you carve this. But with the copper wire, it's bendable, so you can kind of lean the head one way or the other. With a wood dowel, you're stuck with the stiff straight up and down. I suppose uh, you could I'll strand be... a few pieces of copper wire, to, just household copper wire, strand a few together, and then that gives you a little bit more meat. You know, on it. As How well. would you attach the copper wire? Like, uh... you drill a hole in both ends, okay. and then um, just because you've got a lot of body that you can drill it down into. Yeah. And here in the states, I I used to go to um, the recycle places and and buy pieces of copper, copper wire. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do have some 14 gauge copper wire. But it'll uh, it'll just give you the flexibility that if you want to lean the head just a little bit, you'll have that option. So you glue the copper wire to both the ends, right? And then just Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You bet. I've, ju I've just used like a five minute epoxy type of thing, Furtis, when when I'm trying to glue copper and it and okay. it holds beautifully. You want to braid the copper a little bit unless you strand it together so it has something to grip on. That's yeah, make great. it a little bit thicker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's good. Thank you. Was there another comment for Furtis? Yeah, it's it's Daniel yet again. <laughs> uh, Furtis, I noticed you're holding up the Dave's book. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could hold that up to the screen so we could all see what it was. It was the one that I was mentioning. Uh, he has to. He'll have to say something. So oh yeah, yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is the book. <laughs> it. Yeah, it's a it's a yeah, great book. It's another excellent book to work from. Yeah, he goes through the whole process of how to carve the face, and then uh, then he talks about this whole pattern. So he goes through the whole pattern. Um, he's got uh, yeah, so it's pretty good. Uh, he yeah, he doesn't give you a size of block, but uh, what I did was I just kind of uh, used this pattern and enlarged it by 133% and just to make it a little bit bigger than what he has. His, so he, he has a good size in there, but I just wanted to make it a little bit bigger. So yeah, so it's, it's a really nice book. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. Thanks, Furtis. Okay, the next project, uh, Lee Baldwin sent that in. I'll ask again in case Lee is on now. No, I, I think Lee had to work tonight, but he's he did a Cupid for uh, for uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> he did a pretty nice job. Uh, pretty pretty unique Cupid. Okay, and the last one I have here is from Mike. And Mike, you want to speak up on this one? Sure, I'm sure not. There, did I? Can you hear me now? You bet. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was following your ideas of putting a hat on someone and. I have a Tilly hat, I have to admit. And uh, so I decided to make Mr. Tilly. And uh, so he was just a head at one point. And then I added a body and I'm not really sure what he was supposed to be or any story there. And I do like birding. So I thought, okay, now I'll make him into now he's Mr. Tilly bird whisperer. So yeah, I figured, okay, how can I show that he's really good with birds and they love him and everything. So. And I decided, okay, I'll have different birds of different species, all uh, you know, hugging him or offering him a worm or whatever, something to make him look like he's popular with the avian community. And uh, so you can see that the owl on his shoulder and the robin on his hat are uh, added. And then the uh, woodpecker that's giving him a hug down below is uh, part of the original uh, of the body as well as the binocular is stuck in his pocket down below there. Anyway, it was fun to do. And uh, the one thing is a nod to COVID is I was trying to figure out what to do for a worm. And yeah, I could just make one out of wood. It wouldn't be that hard, but I thought it's going to be pretty fragile. 
especially when it's bending all around like that. So I thought, okay, what can I get that can go in the robin's beak that will be flexible and, and not break later as it's in display? And I thought, ah, I looked all over the darn place. I couldn't find anything appropriate. Then I was oh, uh, going to a store and I had my mask on and I realized the straps on the mask, those blue masks that so, that so many of us wear, is sort of perfect for that. So it's the right size and it's flexible and everything else. So it's never going to break as the, as the carving was displayed. So anyway, that's my effort there and throw that into the contest. Oh, that's great. Comments for Mike? Very nice. Well done. Yeah, excellent. I love that hat. It's super how it's situated on the head, kind of tilted back a bit over one ear a bit more than the other. What character, boy. Yeah. And and right. I like the I like the direction of his eyes. Like, did did you I can't remember because I've seen this one before you put the birds on it. Were the eyes already pointing in that direction and you put the birds so that he was looking at the worm or? Um, no, you know, uh, he was looking up that way and I wanted to really be looking at something or other, but I couldn't figure out what the heck he'd be looking at, yeah. uh, you know, the, without making an entire carved scene out of it all yeah. uh, with a whole bunch of add-ons. And I thought, well, what could it be? And it just sort of morphed into this as I thought, Okay, if there's a bird on his hat, and I could have the bird's butt squished up against the side of his hat so I could attach the bird so it's not going to fall off later. <laughs> and even the little uh, talons on the bird were quite difficult because you can't see in these pictures, but each, each of the bird has three toes on each foot. and They were each individually carved and painted and then individually glued on the top of his hat brim. It was, it was actually a lot of mechanical things to do. Yeah. Trying yeah. to get it all sort of in the right direction uh, and shape. Well, it, looks, it looks like you had fun with it and it turned out really comical. It looks really good. So yeah, so I tried to open that eye up uh, further actually than it originally was, the one that's yeah. on that side. Yeah. And made it a little bigger than the other eye. So that because he's looking out that way, and I just tried to exaggerate that look. Tried to tip his face. This all sort of developed for a bit of a time here, and try to follow your you guys' ideas. Uh, you know, tried to get so his smile line is higher on that side than it is on the other side. And trying to you know make it look like he might be you know you like you said I think one point make a lot of funny faces in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually learn a lot. From your own not face. not not that he looks anything like you, Mike. Oh, well, people have said, <laughs> I guess I might be Mr. Tilly. <laughs> Looks good. Thanks. Okay, thanks to everybody for sending in their photos, and hopefully we'll get some uh, updates next time we meet a month from now and, and some new photos and, uh, and have some fun with this show in particular. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is dust control. And, uh, and as I said earlier, Fertis and I had just a quick uh, email conversation back and forth on dust control. And Fertis, all I've done here is, whoops, there we go. I, I've just put this slide together based on, on what we talked about. Do, do you want to introduce this and talk about it and I'll do some color commentary or, or do you want to do it the other way around? Yeah, I can talk about it. Okay, go so, ahead. Uh, just before our... our our email conversation, Mark, I, I didn't have uh, much of a dust collection. Um, as I mentioned, um, I do, I am sensitive to sawdust, so I've got dry eyes. So whenever uh, there's a little bit of dust in the air, I can feel it. Later on, I can feel a little bit of burning in my eyes. So that's why I reached out to you to see how, what you do about it. And as you suggested, I went and uh, I did buy this, this Rikon, uh, the dust collection system that you have on the screen on the lower uh, right-hand uh, box. It's a uh, it's, um, 62450, I bought it from Lee Valley, it's around 300 bucks. I do turn it on on low when I'm carving and it helps me uh, control the dust. And when I looked at the filter the other day, it has two different uh, filters. One is a kind of a small HEPA filter that's beyond on the inside of uh, 
the, there's an external filter that sucks air from one side and then the side that you see over here with, with, with the extension, uh, with the cable there, it, it throws the air out from there. And uh, I was looking at the filter, the one that's outside, and I saw a lot of dust on it. So it definitely is pulling in a lot of uh, dust. So it's helping. Other than that, I also uh, bought um, I was going to ask you, Fertis, um, is this, I, I see it has hangers on it. Um, it does. Is this something you put on your on your tabletop or are you hanging it? No, I just put it next to, like pretty close to where I'm carving on the table. Uh, so it does help in sucking all the sawdust and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's helping me. Other than that, I have also, uh, just to protect my eyes, I also use uh, those goggles that completely sit uh, about my glasses, uh, touching the, sp the skin on my face. So it, that also helps it kind of, um, it, it's not too noisy, like there are three different speeds in it. So it's, it's like, it, it's very minimal sound you can hear. So when you're carving, like when I'm, when I was uh, cutting with the uh, bandsaw, I did put it on the high speed just to make sure that it pulls more dust. But when I'm carving, uh, just put it on the low speed, there are three speeds to it. So uh, I just turn it on on the low speed and it, I can see that it, it's pulling a lot of dust. Sorry. Very good. So it, it helps me. Now I was telling uh, Fertis, this is the unit that I have here and I don't think it's available anymore. Certainly not in Canada, it's not available. And it, it, it's not as efficient, anywhere near as efficient as the one Fertis bought here. But it, it, it has two speeds, and, and like Fertis described, when I'm doing something that's a little bit dusty, maybe um, with a Dremel tool or a Fordham tool, I'll just set that up a few inches away from uh, what I'm working on, and, and it also sucks the stuff in pretty nicely. You can see it pretty nicely take care of it. Uh, this was fairly inexpensive at the time. I think I spent $100 on it or less, and, but uh, I don't think it's any longer available. I, I also have the, the, the mask that you have, have up on the screen. I bought that as well, but I just put that on when I'm cutting on the band. So I don't use that uh, when I'm actually carving, mm -hmm. but yeah, I got that as well. How big is that King unit? This, oh, the King, right? the, this is, a, I think it's a half horsepower. Um, you know, in terms of dimensions from here to here, it's probably about three feet. Um, I find it useful when I'm using the Fordham tool, I just turn this thing up so that it's, it, you know, it's pointing up and I work on with the Fordham tool right over and it pulls everything through. I also have a very small lathe and I'll just put that up against the back of the lathe and it, it's good for sanding on the lathe that won't pull a chip of the, off the lathe then. And if it does, it'll clog things up and you're always cleaning right here when that's the case. But this was a fairly inexpensive unit. Um, you know, similar to what Kurt, Curtis was saying about this, it's fairly quiet to use. And, uh, and it does the trick for Fordham. If you're using Fordham, this isn't really gonna keep up on it. The, this is just sort of for clearing the, the, the workshop area. With the Fordham will pick up everything here. And I got this, as Fertis was saying this, he got this, I, I got this for Christmas actually. Uh, and uh, I, had, I had a previous one that did a good job, but I find this one really comfortable. It, it fits very tight, even, you know, with, I have a beard, it fits very tight. And uh, if I put my hands over the, the two filters and try to draw in, breathe in, you can't. That, it's that nice, uh, nice a seal. So I, I think this is a fairly good unit uh, that Lee Valley is, is offering right now. So having said that, and, and what, what Fertis had to say about it, uh, what are some other ways people are, are managing dust in your workshops? Um, if I, I could, uh, I found um, if you get into uh, KW Electronics or one of the electronics stores, you can buy the uh, 12 volt muffin fans. You can pick them up for, for five bucks a piece if you look around and set them up in a row and then in front of them put a regular furnace filter and then build a box around it. If you're so inclined to, 
to do that. And then you just sit it down in, in your bench in front of you. Uh, the the, uh, the boxes that are designed the, that way, the professionally made ones are quite expensive, but for 50 bucks, you could probably wooden everything all in. You can uh, build a, and it, it sucks the, 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 the dust through works uh, it worked good for me good good any other thoughts mark i use uh <clears throat> i use two things i use a an outfit similar to the king um on my carving bench i actually have an opening cut right on the on the table on the on the uh on my carving bench and then i i take that rectangular um opening that's on the on the king and I slide it underneath so it's a downdraft and then I have I have lucite uh, panels that I've designed that collapse but they funnel the air right in and it works excellent with the Fordham then the other thing that I use is um, I made a portable dust collector using a, a, a fan that's intended for for a bathroom and it's all collapsible again has a lucite panels and I, on the front side of it, um, I use a, a material similar to what you would have for a, an air filter for a furnace. And on the back side, um, I've, I've uh, of the, this is the back side of the, the fan for the bathroom. I just used a piece of aluminum um, ductwork, and I have a pillowcase that I put on there, mm -hmm. and it works well to take to our carving club. And if you want, I could I could send you some pictures of of both the collapsible um, lucite things that I've made and the uh, and the portable dust collector. Great, that'd be that'd be great. I, I like your idea of cutting a hole in the in your tabletop and having that mounted right on top of it, so it'd be comfortable with the Fordham tool, you know, as you're leaning forward. So, because I just stand up with mine, this would allow me to sit down and work right at the table. That's a great idea. It it works uh, it works well, and I have I put a bit of a mesh over the top of it so that I don't drop any tools down there and and wreck the dust collector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, I'd appreciate it if you sent those pictures, and I'll uh, I'll send them off to everybody. Okay, any other comments? Okay, thanks for that discussion. All right, so the next piece is going to be tips, chips, and tricks. You know what? I can't see um, a clock from where I am. What time is it? Have we got some time? 7.38. Okay, got about 20 minutes. Okay. Eastern Standard, Eastern Standard Time, it's 7.38. 7.38, we got 20 minutes. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of things. Um, Dave was just speaking about um, his dust collection. One of the things that Dave and I talked about probably three or four weeks ago, he was doing a, a carving where um, much like Bob's uh, carving, the, the arm was going to be in an odd position. And so he used the doweling and gluing method. And we talked a little bit about that. So just as a reminder, that this is what we showed at the time on, on how to put in accessories like an arm. And we just, I just did this very quickly so that you could see it. But the idea was to put a dowel in. This looks like it was about an eighth of an inch dowel, lead up or graphite up one piece of um, the two mating surfaces, put a little line so that you're always replacing the arm in this case in the same spot, give it a little bit of a wiggle, pull it off, see where the lead or graphite ended up on the arm, carve that away, keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that. And pretty soon you get a real nice tight fit. And so Dave was actually asking about the doweling and, and how to secure the arm when you're gluing afterwards. So the doweling to me, and this is my point of view, and I'll be interested in hearing others' point of view, the doweling isn't really a strength item in these sorts of situations the glue is going to be the strength item. The doweling for this purpose here is just to make sure you're putting the, the arm, if you're doing an arm, back in the exact same place every time and wiggling it. Because if even you put it in a, you know, a 16th of an inch off either way, you're going to be chasing all of these marks all over the place because you're not putting it in the exact same place every time. So that's what the dowel is for. 
the second part, the second reason why you use a dowel though, is that when you go to glue this now, let's, let's pretend that you're at the gluing phase, you've removed all of that graphite either with your knife or uh, preferably you've washed it off. And now you're gonna glue that. Often when you're gluing one of these oddball shaped arms to a body, it's an oddball angle. And you go to try to clamp it and it moves away. So your, your, your glue is wet and every time you go to put any pressure this direction, it's moving off of where you want it to be. So that's the second reason why you use that dowel. That dowel will make sure that that, that arm doesn't move away as you clamp it down. Now, how much clamping force do you need? Not a lot of clamping force. I have one of these little um, clamps, you know, the pistol type clamps, they have little on the jaws, they have a kind of a rubbery plastic uh, inserts. Often that rubbery plastic insert will take up any irregularities in the wood or an off angle and still give you the clamping. But sometimes you just can't <coughs> use that. You can't get a clamp on it. And um, one of the things that I've used is just masking tape. Uh, if you get a good quality masking tape, you'll find that when you pull it, it won't rip. It'll give you, a, it's a little bit of elastic. There, it's a little elastic. And so it, it's springy. You can pull it a little bit. And just by putting the masking tape on it and pulling it tight and around the carving, putting another piece of masking tape, pulling it tight and around the carving, that's often enough, I find, to give you enough clamping action to get a good, solid, tight fit. Now, you've done all your work with that graphite to make sure you're getting the tight fit. And so now you're just making sure that tight fit is maintained over that dowel while the, the glue is drying. So the question also came up, what kind of glue? So I've used uh, like a five minute epoxy in some cases, but I normally use just a cabinet maker's glue. So you might call that white glue, but if you go to the hardware store, it's more of a yellow, it's a, it's a cabinet maker or carpenter's glue. Um, you know, that kind of glue, the, 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 carb, the cabinet maker's glue, if you can clamp that for about 30 minutes, it's on, it's on there. And then, it, and then you let it cure for, you know, the, a day type of thing. And so if you can clamp that down and keep it clamped for 30 minutes, you, you're going to end up with a good strong joint there. So that's been, that's been my experience with that. Um, the, the other thing that I'll mention uh, that Dave and I talked a little bit back and forth on, uh, on email. You guys will remember this carving here. Well, obviously those two arms are pinned. So those two arms, I used that method of getting those arms in there because I didn't want the grain of the wood going in this direction on these arms. It would have been just too fragile. This arm, I was a little bit less worried about because it was gonna be secure here and it was gonna be secure at the top of the hat. This arm I was a little more worried about just because it's out in the air here and it probably can get knocked some years from now. But you can see here, I, I wanted to show the back of this. So once you get that seam, even though it's tight, you know, you, you could argue you're still going to see a line there, but you can do an awful lot with wrinkles to hide that line. And even if you, you know, go to your, your, your closet and look at one of your suit jackets or a sports jacket, you'll see that the, the wrinkles go in different directions when you put it on. And you're always going to see a seam in that jacket to some extent. So don't drive yourself crazy trying to get an absolutely smooth surface there. It's okay to see that little bit of seam. But you can see also that a lot of that seam is hidden in the valley of one of these wrinkles. So that's, that, that's the way I've always gotten away from that kind of thing. And, and the last thing I'll say in terms of tips and tricks here with dowels, is I'll remind you of this one. So in this case, I didn't dowel this arm in. So all of the grain is going in this direction, up and down. And I didn't dowel it in because I wasn't expecting any weight to be carried by this particular arm. In fact, I knew this arm was gonna have a box on the end of it. Now, this box is hollow. I made all the sides of the box and then glued it together and then carved it so it's light. But I didn't still want any of the weight on this hand. And so there's a dowel that runs from this fella's body in, into that box, okay? And, and that, I think it was like a quarter inch dowel or so. And so any weight or any pressure that somebody were to put on this 
on this box isn't going to end up on the sculpture's hand and break the arm. It's going to all be borne by this this spot right here on his back. And I did that graphite thing with that with that dowel here, so that there was a bit of a flat surface there where the box was pushing on the shirt and gave me something to you know like a bearing surface if you want for the groove. Okay, so that's my tip on on dowels. Uh, Dave, did you want to add anything to that? You were you were working on a carving using this method. No, I think you've uh, I think you've covered that really well. Yeah, yeah. Just explaining the purpose of the dowel is not strength; it's positioning. Yeah, great. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, John, you uh, you've got a a tip you wanted to review with us. Okay, this is how uh, this. You hear me, Mark? Yep, perfect. Okay. Yeah, this is how I locate the ear, the ears on the other side of the head. Before I cut out the, the head or of the carving, I'll draw, I'll draw a line across with a square and a square across the top, across the bottom, across the, the and bring it right around all, all the carving to locate it on the other side of the head. So we want to flip that next page, Mark. Is that the one on you flip next page, Mark? Yeah, uh, I think I do. I think I have it, John. Okay. Yeah, so that's how I locate the ear at, uh, on both sides of the head, and it's uh, and as soon as you you got to do it with the flat block, the flat piece of wood, and then you uh, once you cut out the the head, the, the other side has the exact side, the same side as the the ear would be. Be the location be the exact same spot. That's my tip. That, that, that's a good tip because I know you know I, I don't do it that way. I haven't done it that way in the past, and I end up with kind of a rounded head. And now I'm trying to figure out where the ear is, and you're just trying to eyeball it back and forth. It's kind of hard. Yeah. If I do that before I cut it out. Yeah. Okay. Any comments or questions? Any questions. <clears throat> Okay, the last tip and trick. And so I, I was telling Bob when he uh, did his little man sitting on the, the bench with the dog that it's really difficult to maintain proportions of arms and legs when they're not in their sort of standard form straight down beside you type of thing. And so this is a little way that I did it. So this is actually the, the body of a, a cowboy that I was doing, if you want. And I wanted, I wanted, his arm in this case was going to be up on a uh, on a fence and so where should that go i mentioned earlier that one way of doing that is to use clay and so i've actually even done just a clay arm and figured out where it ought to go but i've also done it this way and so these are um these are just wooden stir sticks for coffee and i just cut the length that i know i want to maintain from the shoulder or from the body to the shoulder and the length that I want to maintain from the shoulder to the elbow and the length I want to maintain from the elbow to the wrist. And I, I can move it in any direction. These are just little wood pins I put in. I've used straight pins as well. But once I get that position the way I want to, then just a little dab of glue freezes it. Now I can take that piece and I can hold it over a piece of basswood and I can flesh it in, you know, make it a lot broader to to show a shirt and whatnot, but I can flesh it in from a top view standpoint. I can turn it sideways on the block, flesh it in from a, a side view standpoint, cut it on the bandsaw, and I know that arm's going to end up where I want it to end up. Are the, okay. Is that popsicle sticks you're using there? You, you could use popsicle sticks. This is thinner. The, these are just little uh, stir sticks for coffee. Same thing. I've seen people use cardboard, use you know just a piece of cardboard, and and it'd be the same thing. Hinge it out that way, where when it's where you want it to be, just freeze it in place with a little bit of glue, and then you're off to the races. Okay, so that's my little tip. I'd like to add to that, Mark. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> you can use your wife or your husband as a model, like this. My, can you see my carving here, Mark? Yeah. 
Do, do you still use the glue or not? Yeah. <laughs> this is my wife's arm, and this is my wife's arm this way. I took a picture of her. I got her to take a uh, to, to model. Now she's a supermodel. For I got a pair now. You think she's a supermodel? But anyway, that's and I, and I got all the wrinkles from her shirt that she was wearing. So and her hand that was her fingers. That's her hand that I I took a picture of, and that's her arm. So that's another tip. Yep, that's great. I have a picture of Peggy with a blanket over her shoulders holding a 30 out six in her arm. And she, she told me she'd leave me <laughs> if I ever showed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was but thinking about showing my pictures, but I, I was going to get, he's in her pajamas. No, no, work. no, that's right. <laughs> okay. Well, folks. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Listen, th thanks for a, a good evening. I hope uh, everybody uh, enjoyed the discussion and was able to ask any questions that, uh, that you, that you had on your mind. Um, John and I are always available. Um, if you want to chat between now and the, the next time we meet, and if you have some ideas for the next meeting, uh, that's great as well. We'll certainly get those uh, on the agenda. Okay. Hey, Mark, I just have one quick question before we leave. Uh, what type of uh, clay do we use when you are making a clay model? Yeah, is it um, from Michaels that you can buy, or yeah, you can you can get that. To be honest with you, Fertis, I got it on Amazon, and I can't remember the name of it right now. I'll send you a little email, but it's I, I use the water based stuff. Um, okay. The water water based stuff is really cheap. I think it was uh, I, I want to say it was ten pounds for. $14. No, maybe it was 10 kilograms for $14. It was a lot, a lot of clay. Um, the downside of the water base that I used is that it dries. And, and so it's not something you're going to put on the shelf and use a second time. Um, what, what okay. I would do, what I would do is I'd use this water base and I'd put a wet cloth over it every night. So it wouldn't dry until I got my carving finished. Some people use an oil base. And so that's something you might want to look at. The oil base is something that then would dry and you could put on the shelf and use later for another carving or another model for a carving. To me, the downside of the oil base is that you get oil on your hands and some people react to that. So, you know, now you got to wear like a latex glove or something like that. Okay. But the stuff I used is water-based and it was just off Amazon. It was no more than 13 or $14. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll look at it. This is what, this is what I use. I get that from Amazon. Oh, it does, yeah. It's non hardening. So you can reuse it. Yeah, five pounds. And this yeah. is what folks recommended uh, Mark Akers and Tony Harris recommended for me to use, which is super. I, super I use that as well. I've never, as you can see, I've never used it yet, but I own it now. So <laughs> I'm one step closer to being efficient with it. Yeah. Can you, can you ship it up to Furtis? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I'll look at okay, it. Okay. Th thanks everybody. Have a great, uh, have a great week and uh, look forward to seeing you again next uh, Zoom call.